Hi, good morning. My name is Dr. Stein Hickert. Uh, today I'll be doing a wee read for you on a book that's written by Rita Gunther McGrath that's about the end of the competitive advantage. In this book, she asks organizations to question the assumptions that drives their strategic behavior and their strategic planning process. A revised version of my presentation follows you after. Thank you. I've never said this before. It's an absolute must read. Take it for, as a personal recommendation. It's a book called The End of the Competitive Advantage. It's written by uh, Professor Rita Gunther McGrath. She is a professor at uh, uh, Columbia Business School uh, in New York. It seems that business are finding themselves at the end of a number of things. The jargon, by and large, uh, remains the same. And one of the things that I quoted in, in my thesis was, in the year 2000, the internet will become as normal as tap water. At that time, when I was saying it, it was really revolutionary. And here we are. Um, it's, it's almost more common uh, than tap water. And that begs the question, what are we coming at the end of? When people are saying we're coming at the end of the competitive advantage, what they're referring to by and large, and that's what Rita refers to as well, is just an end of the way in which we think about things. The way in which we think, by and large, is based on certain underlying assumptions. And that leads us to behave in a certain way. So what uh, Rita does is she goes and she looks at the assumptions which determines how we think about strategy, which then determines how we behave in terms of strategy. The nice thing about this book, it's been put together and it's themed in such a way that each of these chapters has got a learning lesson in its own right. And it's not dependent on you reading the preceding chapter. Starts with the end of the competitive advantage, continuous reconfiguration. That's the question I get a lot as a consultant these days. Environments change and it's dynamic and, you know, we have... The question is, okay, so what do I do about it, Stain? What am I supposed to do about it? The answer, theoretically, is a simple one. Well, you have to have a flexible business model. She talks about that in a very structured manner in Chapter 2, when, and she refers to it as continuous reconfiguration. Mintzberg said it first, structure follows strategy. The question is, does it have to be like that? Can my structure not be my strategy? Your assumption is it has to be like that, and that assumption has determined our behavior. And it becomes very difficult if I have to continuously reconfigure because I can't change my strategy all the time or go into a strategic thinking session all the time. Healthy disengagement, what she talks about there is a product come to the end of its life cycle, but by and large, it's an ego keeps it going because you don't want to let it go. And what she's arguing is that it's not a bad thing when a product comes to the end of its life cycle. Let it go but you can do it in a structured and in a planned manner. Resource allocation to promote, she talks about deafness. Deafness is uh, another word for swiftness. That's that flexibility that I referred to earlier on. Building and innovation proficiency. The current thinking is that strategy and innovation is two separate things. You find in organizations or strategy and creativity is two, two separate things. And, and what uh, Rita argues here is the two is actually uh, merged together. So you're talking about, when you talk about innovation and strategy, it's not necessarily two different things. It's more a question of the so-called sustainable competitive advantage. That sustainability, that long-term, uh, the assumption that something has to be long-term, that's what she's attacking vigorously through the book, moving towards so-called uh, temporary or transient advantages. And then the last chapter, it's a chapter that's aimed at you. How do you need to think about your career? your future in the organization. Evolution of strategies. By and large, after the Second World War, strategy as they planned battles in during wartime became something that organizations start to adapt as a methodology. There she talks about the sustainable competitive advantage, really attacking uh, the, the idea or the assumption that something needs to be sustainable. And then there's this gap that she refers to between traditional approaches to strategy and what she calls the real world. And she says that the lines have crossed where your change, the pace of change and the intensity of change now is ahead of organizations. If I had time here and I had change there and I had two lines, you would always find that the organization is slightly ahead. They can see the change coming so they can plan for it, they can be ready for it. Hence, structure follows strategy. But what has happened in terms of change 
is it starting to, to do that? And that's why she's saying that you need to fundamentally change that assumption and rather look at how flexible uh, you can be in terms of your reaction towards that change because you can't always see the change coming. The traditional approach would be I work on forecasts so I can plan for what's going to come and to now rather look at flexibility where I need to work at how quickly I can respond to whatever has changed. Chapter 1 introduces the whole uh, nuts and bolts of the end of the competitive advantage. When you use Porter's Five Forces, the assumption is that you are only competing in a industry. And she invites us to change our thinking from industry to what she calls arena. There I would have my goal. From an industry point of view, it would be pos positional advantage to go and capturing territory, moving into other industry bands, not just staying stuck in the one that I'm in. You don't have time to go through all of these, but just to summarize, the chapters are all broken down like this, where it takes you from where you are to where you can be if you uh, employ the new line of thinking. This is the only part of the book which is more or less the same as what we view a product life cycles at the moment. The only distinction that she makes is that this part here can actually be controlled in a structured manner. I want to read you something from the book which really impressed me. In uh, 2010, my research team tracked down every publicly traded company on any global exchange within a market capitalization of over a billion US dollars at the end of 2009. Now, they identified close on 5,000 organizations. Then we examined how many of these firms had been able to grow revenue net income by at least 5% every year for the preceding five years. In other words, from 2004 to 2009. At the end of the day, they managed to get a total of 8%. So only 8% of these 5,000 organizations actually managed to grow consistently at 5%. And the reason why she chose 5% is because the, the global GDP at that stage was hovering around about 4%. And then she decided, okay, well, maybe she must also look at uh, the period post-2009, which is, by and large, the economic recessionary time that we still find ourselves stuck in. And she found that almost exactly the same percentage and the same companies managed that growth rate. Now, this was quite phenomenal because this proved the point that she's trying to make, that that growth, that 5% growth, is not dependent on what happens in the economy. It's dependent on how these organizations operate despite the environment. The research is solid because what she then does is she puts forward what she calls the new strategy playbook. And it's based on these successful organizations. She then looked at what did they do to be so successful. And that by and large drives this uh, introduction of her in terms of new ways of thinking. So let's just look at that the major finding strategies with long-term perspectives on where they want it to go, but also with the recognition that whatever they were doing today wasn't going to drive their future growth. That, ladies and gentlemen, in itself is revolutionary. That's revolutionary. That's the biggest assumption that she pulls apart in terms of this book. Continuous reconfiguration, that's the flexibility that we spoke about. Extreme downsizing and restructuring. You get to a point where you realize, oh, now we need to restructure. Emphasis on the exploitation phase. And what she's trying to say is, well, you should actually flatline your focus and your energy across all these stages. Stability or dynamism alone. So we are either stable or we dynamic. It's never a combination of the two. Narrowly defined jobs and roles. Stable vision, monolithic execution. Then she takes you from that to the other. Continuous morphing, in other words, constant change. Equal emphasis on the entire wave. Stability combined with dynamism. That's the trick, ladies and gentlemen. So Millikan goes between the 1940s and the 1960s, and they see this challenge in the textile industry. What do they do? They analyze their organization to see what are we really good at. One of the things that they were phenomenal at is their glue with which they stuck the zipper to the pants, was an exceptional glue. It survived over all these years. It's one of the companies that's used as an example, as an example, and it now specializes in speciality materials and high IP specialized chemicals. It morphed all the way from being a pure and simple textile industry to focusing on this technical ability to make this glue and from there go into specialized products.
That's an example of that continuous morphing. Stability combined with dynamism. Healthy disengagement from and to. Defending the advantage to the bitter end. We know that. You can have a look at the rest yourself. Let's quickly talk about the example here. Everybody's familiar with BlackBerry. We've done a lot of research on BlackBerry. because it's a fascinating case. It's the most recent case of a company that really owned the market. The statistic was that 78% of everybody that had a Samsung in South Africa switched from BlackBerry to Samsung over a period of the last 18 months. The model is aimed predominantly at the business executive. And we have to do something to get the younger generation, the new market. I think they offer them a package, a very cheap package. They make it affordable because they know effectively parents pay for that. And all of a sudden what you have is you have a gazillion teenagers running around BBMing everybody. So all of a sudden the executive that used to be the prime focus, the prime client, keep on dropping line, keep on not being able to access email, not being able to browse, can't use the phone anymore for what they used to use the phone for. What they didn't do right, what Rita talks about, is that when you change and when you morph and when you exit, you have to do it in a, with a steady rhythm. You can't do it all of a sudden. There's a danger in doing it all of a sudden. Resource allocation. What would you have done in the past? Well, I would have spent most of my money on forecasting. Or I spend most of my money to build in this flexibility. Building uh, an innovative uh, proficiency. A lot of the thinking in an organization is ingrained in the leadership. So we can't necessarily always expect them to come up with the latest creative innovative idea. The question is then where do we get it? You employ people that shows the tendency of being innovative. They're not necessarily just going to fit in straight away, but you're starting to tap innovative creative ideas from the younger employee in the organization. Assumption that existing advantages will persist. Two, existing advantages will come under pressure. The assumptions that we have when we plan for sustainable competitive advantage, that's the assumption that we need to question. Last chapter. This is for you, the individual. She says that typically uh, in terms of employment, when you're in an organization, there's a lot of emphasis on analytical strategizing. There's a lot of focus on organizational systems, and you typically as an employee, as an individual, will try and find yourself a place in that organizational system, a stable career path. She battles to give a definition on this, because what is a stable career path these days? Hierarchies and teams, infrequent job hunting. So you don't necessarily put your CV out there unless you have to. You're in the job, you're settling the job, you're comfortable in the job, and then all of a sudden you hear things and you go, when last did I update my CV? Maybe it's time I should get a set. So you do it in an infrequent manner. And then the careers are managed by the organization. From that sort of thinking too, emphasis on rapid execution. She talks about a series of gigs. I like that, as opposed to a stable career path. Individual super, uh, superstars versus teams. In other words, this organization that you enter, you find that organizations when you... Um, when they interview you, it's all about team. Are you a team player? Can you fit in? Will you get along with others? Well, what the hell has that got to do with what I can do? Why do I need to fit in, be a team player? What about the innovation that sits in here? Permanent career campaigns, so don't leave the CV to collect dust and then dust it off only when it's necessary. Do it constantly. And then the last one, which I really like, it's for you to manage the career. It's not for the organization. These are the early warning signs that I want to end off with today. First, I don't buy my own company's products and services. Second, we are investing at the same levels or even more and not getting margins of growth in return. Customers are finding cheaper or simpler solutions that are, in brackets, good enough. Competition is emerging from places we didn't expect. Customers are no longer excited about what we have to offer. We are not considered a top place to work by the people we would like to hire. <laughs> Some of our very best people are leaving. Our technical people, scientists, engineers, for instance, are predicting that a new technology will change our business. The growth tra trajectory has slowed or reversed. Very few innovations have made it successfully to the market in the last two years. The company is cutting back on benefits or pushing more risk to employees. 
Ladies and gentlemen, by all accounts, a must, a must read for where we find ourselves today in terms of strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you.